Hello, my name is Matt Brown. I'm the Interim Dean of the College of Hospitality, Retail, and Sport Management. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for the Dean's Executive Lecture Series. Uh, the Lecture Series was established to bring top industry leaders to campus to speak on industry trends and hot topics. This event series gives our students and the community the opportunity to hear from groundbreakers in the fields of hospitality, tourism, retailing, sport, and entertainment management. Our topic today is leadership and diversity, and it's an important issue that has been in the national spotlight this year. We are honored to have an outstanding panel of speakers today, each bringing valuable insights and diverse perspectives. And I wanna personally thank them for spending their time with us this afternoon. I'd now like to introduce our moderator, Sporty Geralds, Assistant Dean of Diversity and Inclusion for the College of Hospitality, Retail and Sport Management. Sporty, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you for allowing me to host and be the moderator for this uh, great panel that we have today. Uh, I'm excited. We have uh, three heavyweights. Uh, one is a former student. She's a, a lightweight. She's about 100 pounds, but she's one of my favorite all-time uh, students. So we're excited to, to be with you today. Uh, students, uh, if you would, if you do have a question throughout our session today, uh, you can type those in the Q&A box. Uh, and so uh, we're going to get started and let our panelists uh, give a quick little verbal resume. You will have their bios uh, that you should have had before you uh, started today. So we're going to start out with uh, Andrea Smith. And Andrea, if you would, just tell us quickly a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Sporty. And uh, thank you, Dr. Brown. Thrilled to be here today. Um, so as Sporty said, I'm Andrea Smith. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer at Bank of America. I've actually been at Bank of America for 32 years, so a really long time, much longer than many of you are old. So um, got a lot of different experiences I'm hopeful to share today, but I grew up in Oklahoma. Uh, I went to college on a couple of different scholarships and um, started working uh, at the bank when I was 21. It's changed names a lot of different times, uh, and I've had the opportunity to do many different jobs there, uh, but here I am 32 years later. Thanks for having me, Sporty. Tom, why don't you uh, tell us about yourself? Sure, my name is Tom Murray. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at uh, the Charlotte Regional Visitors Authority, and the authority runs a bunch of facilities for the city of Charlotte, the Convention Center, the NASCAR Hall of Fame, the Spectrum Center, and Bojangles and Ovens. And we market the city for tourism and sell conventions um, and that type of thing. So I spent most of my career in the hospitality industry. Um, in fact, I spent about 30 years in the hotel industry. And then I ran a small cruise line for a number of years. And um, uh, my, my, I guess my biggest role in the hotel industry is I was the chief operating officer for Intercontinental Hotels Group for the Americas for um, about 10 years. So I, I was in charge of about 6,000 hotels and $12 billion in, in revenue. So I was, uh, I was lucky enough to have a good career with the hotel industry. Great, great. And here's the former student, Sharif. Hey everyone, uh, like Professor Gerald said, I am a alumni of the USC, um, proud alumni of the HRSM program as well. So I do wanna thank you guys for having me. Um, originally from the great state of Florida, moved around a bunch, um, got my bachelor's at Claflin University in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Um, came to University of South Carolina, got my master's, um, have worked with several professional um, sports teams, including the Jacksonville Jaguars, um, the Oakland A's, the U.S. Tennis Association, um, and now I landed with the Atlanta Hawks. Great, great. Cherise, since you're uh, our first question today, uh, and since you're most closely uh, aligned with this, our first question is, what advice would you give to a smart, driven, college student about to enter the real world? Um, first things first, the real world is real. <laughs> the real world is real. <laughs> I didn't realize that until like I walked across the stage and was like, oh, like this is real life. But, uh, but no, I, I really think that if you continue to, to hold on to the things that you do while you're in college, even though it may seem hard, like even if it's not getting up every day at 7 a.m. and like doing homework and doing classes, if you keep that dedication that you had throughout 
college, through whether it be undergrad, master's, anything like that, it's a lot easier for you to transition into the real world just because the real world is going to hold you at higher standards. So like a lot of times when, you know, you leave school, you're like, oh, I'm done. I never want to have to worry about school again. That's fine. But if you can take just some of those things that you did as far as like dedication and actually like being having your work ethic and that kind of thing into the real world, it'll just make things a little bit, a little bit easier. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Andrea, would you answer that question? Yeah, I, um, I love that answer. I also think, you know, it's hard entering the real world. And a lot of people think you've got to have the perfect job, your final job, the job, you know, that you think you're going to end up in your whole life. And I would just say that's not the case. Take some chances, push yourself, try new things. Um, you actually really don't know what you're going to love and what your passion may be until you try some new different opportunities. So I would say, take some risks and don't put that pressure on yourself to find that job that you think is going to be the forever job because most of the people I know have migrated into their careers and tried different things and that's how they got to where they are today. Um, yeah, I, I would just say that I would view all your decisions through the fact that you're still learning and people think they graduate from school and, and get their degrees and now they can get to work. And I think the truth is that um, what you're really doing is, is developing yourself in those first 10 years at least. And so really think about each opportunity that you look at as a way that you can grow your skills and make yourself more and more valuable to organizations. And so um, lots of times younger folks look at, at, at decisions they make based on where they want to live or who's going to pay them more. But I really don't think that's the lens you should use. I think the lens you should use really is that uh, what is going to make me stronger and better, and more valuable in the long run. And, uh, and so maybe you don't get to live in Charleston. Maybe you live in a city that you don't necessarily want to live in, but it gives you the best growth opportunity. And I think that's, I think that's a good, good lesson for folks. Um, so that's, that's my, point, my, uh, my advice. That's a great answer, Tom. We, we tell our students sometimes you have to take, uh, there's not a direct flight. We have a hub in Charlotte, but sometimes you have to go to Pittsburgh to get to San Diego. So uh, sometimes you have to take a little career detour. Tom, you've spoken to my class several times and, and one of the things that I share with people and one of the things you've shared with our class is even though you had accomplished a lot of great things in your career, uh, I remember when you, you talked about uh, interviewing for the current position that you have and the preparation that went into that. And I have a lot of students from time to time who will you know, ask me, Professor Gerald, what should I do to prepare for this interview? So share with our, our students uh, what you did to prepare for that interview, even though you probably were the most qualified candidate. Yeah, I just think it's really important to take those interviews ser seriously, and and it's good practice and it's good learning as well. And and uh, and the people that are interviewing you tend to be people that have um, had success in the past, and you can learn from them as well. And so I study the opportunity quite a bit, and and I try to think about what I would do if I actually did get that job. And and in, in the job that I took here is is running the visitor authority. Um, there was a large panel of people that were interviewing me. In fact, I think it was somewhere around 18 people. And I studied every one of those people. I, one of them was a, um, a successful pastor in our community. I listened to four of his sermons um, online so that I got to understand how he was as a preacher. Um, believe it or not, that came back to really help me. I had a moment where there was a break in the interview process and I happened to like a sermon that he had got, he had done and I had actually taught the same subject in a Bible study group one time and, and I just happened to be, have a quick word with him about that issue and he's been a great supporter and now he's a business partner of mine. So, but I, you know, I read, you know, I got a book that one of the interviewers wrote. Um, I got a book about the story. One of the interviewers was the group behind the successful um, Valentine development, and I studied that Valentine development like I was uh, was going after a real estate job, and I really all that learnings I, because I got the job later has really helped me understand the community and 
better and, and just made me stronger. I, I often have people come in and interview me and I say, so tell me what you've learned about our organization. And most, of, most often the answer is I, I really don't know much about it. And I just, for me, I'm just always so disappointed and I wouldn't hire somebody that didn't spend the time to at least read my strategy, read our core values, find out what kind of news we've been in the history and, and, and those types of, types of things. So that first job interview is really important and all the job interviews are really important even if you're not necessarily sure you want the job. Um, and so I would just take it as, as seriously as you take a final exam. That's a great answer. Cherie, you want to answer that? You just kind of got into the job market. Yeah, I actually was going to uh, add on to what Tom was saying at the end as far as research. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing as far as when you're just transitioning outside of school, just because when you get out there, there's way more jobs in, that, in what you want to do than what you think. So when people think sports industry, for example, they think, oh, I want to be a coach or a GM or, you know, president. But there's like a million jobs in the sports industry. So you have to be able to like know the job that you're wanting and the only way you can do that is by researching the position itself that will one tell you if you even you know want to take part in this position and two it'll let the employer know that like tom said this person is serious this person knows what we're about they know you know where we're trying to go and they're putting themselves into our plan um and if you can find a way to like insert yourself in what they're already doing they absolutely love it like I, for example, I was in a job interview and even like 10 minutes before, I think I like went through like their Instagram feed and, you know, was just doing some last minute things. And one of the questions in, ended up being something that I had seen on their Instagram. So even like just looking at their website, any type of social media, any type of press releases, just a little bit of things can help you stand out for real. That's great. Andrea, you you bring kind of unique perspective to this question because you've been with the same organization so long, but I'm sure as you move through the ranks, you've had different interviews with different people. So explain or, or share your thoughts on uh, someone who might be interviewing and already know the culture and know about the, uh, the organization, how you prepared for those times that you were trying to, to move up. Well, I think, you know, the, the thing that I would add on that is um, the understanding how the job you're taking fits into the bigger picture is really important. So, you know, if you're interviewing, let's say, for a specific job, how does that fit into the rest of the organization and what does it do to impact the customer experience? That was always something that I dug into, even though I knew the people I was interviewing with. I wanted to make sure I knew how my job fit in and how it was going to help them and how it was going to help the customer. The flip side of that story is I ran human resources for Bank of America for five years, 250,000 people in 40 countries around the world. So I have interviewed a lot of people in my day. And I would say everything that Cherie said and Tom said is absolutely true. The other thing that's so important, be able to look at the person in the eye have a conversation and be able to relay your passion. It doesn't matter if you have the best resume in town and a 4.7 GPA. If you can't convince me why you're the person for me to hire because you've done all your research, but because you're passionate about how you're gonna add value to my company, I'm not gonna hire you. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Tom, I want to go back to you. And, and one of our questions is how, uh, I know this is something you embrace, how do you create a culture of diversity uh, in your organization? Yeah, I think it really, first, I guess it starts with your, I guess it really starts first with the leader and starts at the top and, and how you um, des describe how you, what you want the company to be like. In our organization, we, uh, are common for reciting who we are by, we, we say we're an employee first culture. And um, we believe passionately our success comes from our employees. And so we invest heavily in them. And our goal is to inspire them to come to work every day. And for us, that, um, that, that means we need to think about what makes ourselves the most attractive as an employee. And we've been doing a lot of work around um, um, that lately, and as, as, as society has been faced with these issues um, in particular. And, and I can tell you that 
it's been more important than ever that my C-suite has shown their leadership. Um, we've met, we meet every um, week um, for an hour and a half. Um, and this is the single topic that we talk about every week. And we have a steering committee underneath us that also uh, meets uh, every week and, um, and we continue to grow. Now, we could have just said that we're a good organization because 98% of our employees said in our last survey that they thought this was a very strong characteristic of ours and that they felt there was equity in our organization, but we didn't. We just said, we can be better and we can be a lot better. And we've worked really hard on that. One of the things that we did in, in our organization is, is realize that we also have to be the teachers and, um, and we don't outsource that. We, we, we believe that has to be something that happens within our organization. And we think of all of our leadership as people that should be training those below, in the, underneath them. We created something we call CRVA University, and we have a full, full set of curriculum that people can take at all different levels of our organization, and we encourage it. And our reviews, our annual review process, which is actually on a quarterly basis, um, talks about one thing only, and that's their personal development success. And, um, that we spend a lot of time doing that. So our goal is to create the next generation of leaders in our organization. And we want to do that with an inclusive environment. We believe that there are obstacles to overcome in our world and in the way that equity is felt by all employees. And so we, we're working even harder. Uh, we call it digging deeper to try to make sure that um, that we have thought about that. Right now, most of our employees are going through a 21 day challenge. Many of you may have heard about that, but every day you spend a, a, um, at least a half an hour, most of, most of the time it's a little bit more than that, reading something or watching a video. And then um, at the end of the week, um, the, these smaller groups all discuss what they thought they saw during the week's worth of videos. And it really has been very, very helpful. And, and right now we're in the middle of listening tours. And so we'd have our leaders all divided up among our 300 employees in small groups, just listening to each other and thinking about the ways to move forward. So that's the kind of stuff we're working on. But I, I guess my advice would be, if you don't believe in it as a leader, you know, then it's not gonna work. And so I have to show more passion than anyone else does about the subject. Unfortunately, I am passionate about the subject and, and so, um, we're working really hard to um, be successful as an organization and show our community that it can be done in a, a way that is, is good for our, for our community. Andrea, uh, as we talked yesterday, I, I know your resume speaks for itself with all the things you've done around diversity. And this is a new role for me uh, that I'm in. And, and it's just so much to learn. But can you share how uh, you have impacted, you know, diversity at Bank of America and, and share with our students uh, what you tell your sons about privilege. We talked a little bit about that yesterday. Yeah. I think that's inspiring. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's important. Uh, diversity doesn't happen by accident. It's a very deliberate. And so that's something that we've been very focused on building a diverse culture, building an inclusive culture. And what we started um, doing and talking about is building a culture where people feel like they can bring their whole selves to work, where they don't have to leave part of themselves at the door to come on inside. And that's been something that we started having conversations around and we call them courageous conversations. And we've been doing it for years. We did it um, when Keith Lamont Scott was killed. We had Kerr Putney and Charlotte, the chief of police come in and talk about um, policing. And we, 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 we try to tackle topics that are getting in people's way of bringing their whole self to work. And this year, um, we, we just reignited those with a really, with a, with a sense of urgency. Um, we've had 320 courageous conversations this year with 185,000 of our employees involved. And the topics can be anything. Um, but after the George Floyd killing, um, we, we really started that, you know, how do people feel? How are they bringing their whole selves to work? Are they? What's getting in the way? And what's happened is a lot of listening is going on, a lot of personal stories. A lot of people thought they were really good friends with someone, had no idea 
what walking in their shoes was really like. And that's what we were trying to do was create more perspective, more understanding. And so for me, you know, I've been, I've been at this for a long time, as you said. And so it gave me the opportunity to start having this conversation at home about white privilege. And, you know, as I said, my, my children all said, well, but I have black friends and I have Asian friends. So I'm not a racist mom. What are you talking about? I said, it's not that it's, it's that you were born with the, with white skin. And do you get, do you get stopped? I said to my daughter, do you get pulled over in a department store by the, the clerk wanting to search your bag? No, but I, we, I have friends that do that are black and African American. And so what has happened now is they've used that as a way to go back to their friends to say, has this ever happened to you? And their friends have said, yes. And then my kids are like, but why didn't you ever tell me that? They said, because it's just how I grew up. It's what I do every day. I didn't want to bring you down. And so it just, it's now creating a whole different platform for conversation. And I think that's what's required if we're going to drive systemic change in our country for good. And so it's doing it with your kids. It's doing it with my girlfriends. It's bringing up, it's bringing up the topic all the time. It's putting yourself in an uncomfortable situation, being authentic and trying to understand. And so I think if we all do that, um, we can make such great progress together. Awesome. Awesome. Inspiring. Uh, Katie, do we have uh, any um, questions from our students? We do. We have one for uh, Cherie right now. It's from Ricky Dodge. And Ricky asks, as a Jacksonville native, go Jags. Seeing as you've helped teams from coast to coast, how did you learn the culture of the fan base that you are serving in order to incorporate into marketing that into marketing tactics? Um, was the difference in location and sport significant to your work? Hey, Ricky, Duval. I forgot to have my thing muted, so I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Duval. Um, but to answer your question, um, being that I kind of work with sports for a long time, I've been mostly in the service department or like some sort of sales. Um, so I work like directly with the fans. So that's kind of um, help me get a leg up. Um, but overall, there definitely is a difference in between sports and location. So as far as um, like, I'll take California and the Hawks, for example. So when I was working with the Oakland A's, um, I was in their membership services department. Um, so anything to do with season ticket memberships, I had over 300 um, accounts that I would check on um, throughout the or within a week um, and, you know, make sure everything that they have is good, seeing them at games, doing seat visits. Um, and the way the fans are at an MLB game is completely different than fans at a Hawks game. Um, and that's not to say that they're any better or any worse, but, you know, being having the different demographic of each sport and each area that you live in does take, is considered when trying to market to these fans. So what I would use in Atlanta, for example, we have the um, Trey Young, true to Atlanta, you know, you have a lot of like, uh, prominent, you know, figures in hip hop and, you know, black culture. So and being that Atlanta is 51% African American, there is a difference than how we would market to them versus how we would market to those who are in Oakland, who have a higher um, Latino or Latina population than they do black. So, you know, trying to figure out which type of demographic to reach out to and how to do it authentically and not do it in a way that's kind of like, oh, we're trying to appease to you, but we're trying to get to know our demographic and get to know who, you know, who we're serving. Because a lot of times when people miss that mark, it comes off as corny and maybe like a little too much. But if you really understand who you're working with and those around you by being there on the ground with it, it's a lot easier to kind of figure out the people that you're you're going to be marketing to. That's a great question. Katie, you have an, another one for us? I sure do. Um, I have one for Andrea. Um, in follow up to the diversity question, with respect to leadership and diversity, how have current movements like Black Lives Matter impacted you as a leader as well as your organization? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, well, we've had a lot more conversation about Black Lives Matter. We've had a lot more conversation about how that's impacting all, all of our teammates. We've had courageous conversations, like I was saying before, around Black Lives Matter. 
I think it's also important, and I can't see anyone, so I hope I'm still going here. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I think it's also important, though, that, that demonstrating progress against your diversity goals, like Tom was saying earlier, something that we take into account, we, we measure, we look at it quarterly, but beyond just the metrics, which we have 47% of our workforce are people of color, it's around behaviors and it's around actions and it's around the environment that our leaders create. And so when we're talking about Black Lives Matter, we're talking about it in the whole company and we're doing manager training because we don't wanna leave that up to chance that people know how to have a conversation. These are not comfortable topics and we have 20,000 managers in our company. So we feel like it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we role play and have conversations like that so that people are able to do that and, and really get to the substance of the issue. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I know that you're doing this too. We really hold ourselves accountable, not just to make them better employees and create a better company, but we think actually it may, helps them become better people. Absolutely. And um, we think that's an aspiration that's uh, typically something we take on in HR, right? Making sure people are better. Um, people um, and I, I think that's I think that's something that has been, been a big factor that we've all we're all facing today that it's not just our business but it's our community that we're trying to affect that's exactly right and and that's part of our value set to leave our communities better to have an impact in our communities whether it's through hiring more people whether it's working with our nonprofits whether it's volunteering time whatever it may be well, we're glad you uh, you guys are in Charlotte. I'm a Bank of America customer, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank Five you. years of Bank of America customer, so. Thank you. And I'm willing to come down and talk to everyone else and see if we can get some more customers. <laughs> so uh, that's a great pivot point for us. Uh, Cherie, you have a unique story, uh, one of courage uh, that I just am uh, inspired by. Um, Share with our group uh, of people that are with us today what you did and uh, how it's turned out. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm never good at explaining this story, but um, this, kind, this instance happened um, right after the George Floyd uh, murder. And I was sitting in my room, actually on this couch behind me, doing my work and everything because right now we're working from home and everything. So um, I don't know what it was with that one um, because they've been several, Philanda Castillo, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, but it was something about George Floyd that really had stuck with me. And I, being that we were in Atlanta and like I said, again, the, the population here is, within the city is 51% African-American. And I was like, being that we are quote unquote, true to Atlanta, as we would say, we need to do something. Being that we are one of the three, the big three sports teams here, the Braves, the Falcons, the Hawks, you know, I felt like there was something that we could do. So um, un unthinking that it was gonna do what it did, I sent an email to my uh, to the CEO Steve Coonan, who is now a good friend of mine. Uh, CEO uh, Steve Coonan, um, our diversity and inclusion officer Cami Mackey, um, our head coach Coach um, Lloyd Pierce, and basically spelled out, "Hey, you know, this could have been anybody. This could have been one of our players. This could have been one of our staff members. This could have been any one of us. We need to we need to do something about this. We need to say something about this." And I put in, you know, a few actionable items that we could do, and literally within 30 minutes. I had an email response from Steve and Cami saying, hey, we agree, we're gonna do something right away. And by the end of the day, they had like, um, kind of what Andrea was doing with Bank of America, how they, they started hosting Courageous Conversations. So that very first Courageous Conversation, it was a panel with me, the former chief of police, um, one of our owners, Grant Hill, um, our CEO and everything, just opening it up to our employees saying, hey, this is what's going on. You know, we can't ignore it. We have to address it, face it head on. You know, the people in our organization have these stories and they need to be heard because not everybody understands what's going on. Um, so from there, it kind of blossomed. And um, long story short, 
State Farm Arena is now, it was the first arena to become a voting location for early voting, and it is the biggest voting location in the state of Georgia. Um, so technically, we were the first ones to do it before the NBA mandated it. So, you know, they were kind of following us. But um, overall, I'm just completely proud of the organization itself because I've worked for some organizations, um, not in the sports industry, but other organizations that I don't think, one, I would have the opportunity or the access to email the CEO, letting them know how I feel, or two, then being able to take what I've said and actually use it. Because some people hear it and then you're just like, oh, that's cool, and then move on. But like for the fact that they actually took this initiative and are continuing to do things like, um, today we just actually had a press release, um, the Hawks and our owners um, have actually donated $40 million into the African American community here in Atlanta, trying to build um, up black small businesses and black ownership throughout the um, city of Atlanta. So. It's been great, um, not to say the least, but not gonna lie, I didn't think it was gonna be as big as it was, but I'm honestly grateful to have the opportunity to, to make that difference. Uh, Sheree, and I, and I just, I think what's unique about your story is, is that you were the self-professed low man on the totem pole, so to speak. You'd only been there a couple of months, which that's the, the, the courage that it took because most people would have just said, I'm gonna, stay in my lane and make sure I don't, you know, get people to notice me too much. So uh, tell us a little bit, you, you're a product, you came to our program from a historical black college and university, what we call HBCUs. Tell us a little bit about how maybe that experience and, and your time at Claflin uh, prepared you for that moment. Um, I would say I am a proud, very, very, very proud graduate alumna of an HBCU, Claflin University, the very first HBCU in the state of South Carolina, actually. Um, so Benedict is actually right down the street as well as Allen there in Columbia. Um, but I honestly think that gave me the confidence. I, I don't think I would have had that confidence or pride in my own culture to make that decision to send that email had I not attended an HBCU first. You know, not saying that if you know non HBCUs wouldn't have given me that courage, but being around people who looked like me and had the confidence like me and they built up that culture in me, I think really helped me see that hey, like this isn't an anomaly, an anomaly, excuse me, this is something that you know everybody could do, you know, like so having that background, I think, made it a little bit easier for me because. I don't know, it was just like second nature, I guess. And um, that kind of promoted me to, 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 new, to new heights. So awesome. go HBCUs. <laughs> well, we're, we're so proud of you. Uh, courage is one of those cornerstones of, of personal integrity. And I want to, Tom, I want to go to you. And, and if you would talk about uh, why personal integrity is so important. You don't build a career without it, but just share some of your thoughts on integrity and, and how you've tried to demonstrate that throughout your career. Yeah, I think, you know, when you get to roles in leadership and you will have people working for you or we can call them followers and leaders, that um, you, um, you're going to need to have people that want to be part of what you want them to be part of. And there's no way anybody's going to follow you if they don't think you have integrity. And um, so it's really important for you as a leader to think about um, being the kind of person that others um, could look up to or could look to for advice or could want to follow. Um, and, um, and that means you really have to hold yourself to a higher standard. I did this with our C-suite and I've done it a number of times in my career. We signed a contract around that um, between each of the, the C-suite and defined our, what we, how our behavior had to be like and pledged to each other that we wouldn't break that. And that if we ever did, that we would come running to each other and stop the action. And, um, and um, to, I'm, you know, knock on wood, we've done a really good job so far. And I think it's particularly important because I'm in the public eye and, you know, there are ramifications to lots of people um, in my organization. If, for instance, I'm, um, I, my reputation is, is soiled in, in the media, that hurts the people that work for, for our organization more than me. And so that's really important. So 
But I think, quite frankly, as you look at your growth going forward, you know, all of your potential bosses and people that will help uh, mentor you and enable your growth, they're always going to look for this characteristic first because it, it, it reflects on them as well if they're in your corner and supporting you. Um, and quite frankly, all of us, I'm sure Andrea would agree with this, um, had people in our lives that made our careers happen. And um, I had folks like that as well. And, and, um, and they wouldn't have supported me if they thought that I would, would, uh, would um, do things that it could embarrass them or the organization. Um, so, I, I mean, it's been really important to us. It's, it's one of our core values as an, an organization. And, um, and we speak about it all the time. Great. Uh, Andrea, uh, I'd like your thoughts on that question as well. Um, well, I won't, I agree with everything Tom said. I guess I'll give it a bit of a different angle that, you know, coming into your first job, I remember coming into mine and I saw people doing things that I would never do. And I saw them take credit for other people's work. I saw bosses take credit for people's work. I saw people cheating on their expense reports. I mean, all of those things are around integrity. And at the end of the day, you, you, you take integrity with you wherever you go. You might change jobs 20, 30 times, but you've got to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and know that you are operating to your values and to your standards. And so I don't think there's anything more important. I think it also includes owning up to your mistakes. Don't let someone else take the fall if you've made a mistake. Own it. Apologize. Fix it. Tell people, you know, you won't let that happen again. But it's it's all those little things to me that I've seen over the course of my career that get to this point of integrity. Now, I will also say that I'm on the PGA of America board and I am um, I was the first woman non-PGA person to be on the PGA of America board. And you know what? People cheat at golf and that's a huge integrity game. And I think you <laughs> learn a lot about people's character if you see this happening. And so... I call people out on it all the time. You know, did you just kick that ball? I hope you're going to take a stroke. I mean, you know, in, in a nice way, but if they're going to do it there, what are they going to do somewhere else? So I just think it's, it's you know, when I, I, people ask me all the time, what would you put on your, what would you want on your tombstone? And when I was running HR, you know, you have to make some very difficult decisions, but you always do it respecting the person with integrity and people know that you're fair. And that's, that's really, I think, what, what you want to be known for. Awesome. Cherie, I'd like for you to take a little bit different uh, twist on that because you're in sales uh, and a lot of our students are going to, that's an entry point, uh, particularly in sports management and, and some of our other majors. Uh, talk about why it's important because people are, are trying to move ahead and, and they want to be the top salesperson. Uh, talk about why integrity is important in your role uh, with the Hawks. Um, really, integrity is the only thing that you have when you're selling anything. Um, you, that's really all you have is your word, because a lot of times what people will do will try to, you know, say a little bit of hit this or a little bit of that just to try to sweeten the deal to like close the deal. But at the end of the day, People are going to find out. Whatever my mom, grandma always told me, whatever's done in the dark always comes to light. So the little lie that you told here, the little lie that you told there is going to come back and haunt you. And also something someone told me was people are always watching you. So even when you think someone isn't watching you, someone is. So a lot of times when promotions and that kind of thing are up for people, it's more than just the numbers. It's more than just how many people that you're selling or how many people that you're calling in a week. It's about how do you fit into our company culture of integrity? How have you been, a, we have this thing called a good teammate. So every week we have a little, you know, a little moon statue and we give it to someone who's been a great teammate for that week. And what being a great, great teammate means is, you know, if someone already reached out to a prospect and you know, that prospect contacts you, you don't go ahead and take that prospect. You let somebody else know, hey, I saw you talking to that person, just wanted to give you a heads up. Or even like a, hey, we have a meeting at three, you know, just a, a quick reminder, you know, just something, something small. But being able to fit into that company culture of integrity is going to mean a lot more than you trying to 
sneak and get an extra three thousand dollars in sales because someone is going to notice and you you're just going to get the back end of that i'll say that <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, a guy named Alan Simpson said, if you have integrity, nothing else matters. If you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. So uh, very important. Um, Katie, do we have a, a question from our students? We sure do. We have a few. Um, one from Michael Rubin for Tom or for any of the panelists um, regarding mentors. What are the best qualities to look for in a mentor? So I, I had a mentor a lot of my career, my career probably about 20 years. Um, unfortunately, he passed away, um, and, but he was the president of Intercontinental, and I was the chief operating officer. But um, I think one of the things that always inspired me was that um, the way that he treated people. And um, I can tell you a quick story. I, I was ahead of a project to build a hotel in Atlanta. It was the Intercontinental in Atlanta. And I, I, know I always thought I was a really good, good with people. And, um, and, and I remember I used to tip the guys a lot of money when they helped me out because I knew they were living paycheck to paycheck. And, and I thought, well, you know, they always seemed happy to, to know me. But um, I found out later, actually, at my best friend's funeral, that um, that um, he had a special relationship with this one particular guy, this doorman that I thought I knew really well, and his this doorman's son was shot and uh, killed, and, and he, my mentor, attended his funeral, and um, took care of the family and and did some things financially for them, and. Um, I never even knew it happened, and he was really my employee, and I was just, I was just reminded about how this guy was, even though he ran, you know, 27 countries, you know, billions of dollars in revenue, 100,000 employees, we still, um, he still knew one doorman in one hotel well enough to, to be there for them in a moment of crisis, and so I think the thing that I look to most is how they treat people. And um, and I and I looked. For, I always just followed him because it w it was really important to him that people really understood what you were trying to do, and so he used to say it and say it again and say it again. So I used to say, "Don't you have any other good ideas?" And for years we did the same thing all the time. We he said the same thing all the time. I realized that that was the way to do it. I still do it today. Now I. I remind everybody what we're trying to do over and over and over again because they don't always hear it. And uh, so that, I think that was really uh, an important part of that. His humility was incredible for a man that was that powerful. Uh, Andrea, when we spoke yesterday, I asked you specifically about that mentoring question. So I'd like you to share and, and you have a unique perspective on that as well. Yeah, you know, I've had some great mentors over the years, and the thing that has been consistent about each of them is their um, ability to deliver very candid feedback to me, even maybe if I didn't want it or know it. So, you know, a couple of examples I'll never forget. Um, one, I was, um, you know, well, first, my very first boss, uh, a woman, you know, pulled me aside and said, listen, I don't know, this is your first big job. I was 21 years old. And she said, you know, I just want to make sure, you know, do not chew gum at work. I'm like, cool. <laughs> but, and I think I maybe had been chewing gum. You know? And uh, I said, oh, gosh. And, and, you know, so then my next, so I remember that always. I've shared that with people. Um, and then the next one was, it, you know, if you're going to go out at night with a group of people after work, don't have more than one drink and you have to come in the next morning. There's no, everyone will know you're out. So if you drink too much or do too much or stay out too late and don't make it in, that's not gonna be good. But as my career went on, you know, I, I remember um, another story where I was in this terrible job. Um, and as I said yesterday, I think it's really important, I said it earlier today, to, t to try a lot of different things. It's just as important to figure out what you like as you don't like. And this particular job was in ATM operations. I didn't like it. I went and talked to the coordinator of, of the area. And I said, you know, this, this is terrible environment. Everyone's crying. And she said, 
well, what's your solution? I said, what do you mean? I, I mean, I'm the low man on the totem pole. I don't have a solution. She's like, don't ever bring a problem to me again unless you have a solution. And I said, uh, okay. And she said, no, go figure it out. So I went back and I gathered everyone in the office together. I remember I'm 22, 23 years old and all these people are much older than me. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. What can we control? Well, we can have potluck lunches. We can, you know, do, so we started doing things that we could control to create a, a, a better environment. We couldn't control our boss, but we tried to, so I've always remembered that, you know, yes, identify problems, but also identify solutions. And the boss may not go with your solution, but they're certainly going to appreciate you coming forward with some ideas of how to fix something. Um, the other, you know, I, as I said yesterday, um, I think it doesn't matter if you're a mentor. I get questions all the time. Did you have a lot of women mentors? No, there are hardly any women in senior positions at the bank when I started in 1988. But I picked mentors based on characteristics or leadership traits that I admired. And it didn't always work. I would ask people if they would spend some time with me because I saw how they handled XYZ situation. I'd buy them a coffee you know, see if I could buy them lunch and pick their brain. And sometimes you would click and sometimes you wouldn't. And sometimes they would say no. And, and you just have to keep asking though. It's not, if you stop asking when you get the no answer, then you're probably not gonna get the benefit of some great thinking. The last thing I would say that's been really important is mentors being very candid and giving me straight up, you know, not trying to say, oh, you did great, but saying, you know what, that was really terrible. You, you put off half the room by the way you did that. If you would have done this, I think you would have brought everyone along with you. And so I've been really lucky for the last few years to have Hugh McCall as my mentor. Um, he's you know 87 years old and he has a lifetime of learning. And I, we meet once a month for breakfast or lunch and talk about candid. I mean, you, you, you know, we've gone through <laughs> pretty much everything I still have to develop, which is a long list. But <laughs> I really appreciate that because you want someone that's going to help you get better. And you want that unfiltered advice and guidance. And you know, at the end of the day, they're doing it because they want to see you be successful. Sharia, I see you shaking your head quite a bit. Do you have anything you want to add to that as a young person and trying to grow in your career? Um. I would just say ditto to everything they said, but uh, just make sure that the mentor is okay with them being a mentor. Cause I've had several people who I've kind of like asked, oh, can you be my mentor? And then they'll say yes, but then they'll stop talking to me for like years on it. Even when I try to like, you know, <laughs> keep in contact with them, they just don't contact me back. So just make sure that the mentor that you have knows that they're your mentor and understands what it means to be a mentor, because I've had a few people ask me to be their mentor, and I'm like, I can, I can help, I can advise, because I just personally right now don't think I'm ready to be your mentor, and that's okay, and it's okay for someone to tell you that, but just make sure, because you don't want to set yourself up for the okie doke, so just make sure that the mentor you have knows and is okay with being a mentor. I, I think that is at the at fantastic advice, and I think it's also great to be able to understand your own commitments before agreeing to be one. And so, you know, I get a lot of emails to be mentors or sponsors. I will take a meeting with anybody that sends me an email because I figure if they have enough courage to send me a note, then I want to sit down and talk to them. But that does not mean that I will be their mentor. And I make that point very clear. I'm happy to help. I'm happy to give you advice. I'm happy to connect you to somebody else, but I don't have capacity to do that right now. But I think that's such an important point, Sheree. Katie, I know we're coming to about the end of our time. Do you have one more really outstanding uh, question maybe that you want to sure share? Sure do. I have a lot of outstanding questions <laughs> uh, from students, but one from Andrew Hahn. Uh, in the new normal, many people from a variety of different walks of life have faced new or even intensified issues with their mental health. What are some things that you all have done in an effort to assist your employees and coworkers through the adjustments that have now come with how we live and work in the quote new normal. That's for anyone. Tom, why don't you start us off? Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is something that I'm really quite worried about. I worry about it every day. Quite frankly, every time I speak to my team, I end by saying that I want them to take care of themselves. I, it is not all right to work yourself 
to stress and to there's a lot of stress on them their lives right now. Even with my talking about that, I've had one one executive have a heart attack. I've had another one have have a stroke, um, and their doctor said they were stress related. And so this is a really stressful time, and mental health is a real deal. And so I've really asked people um, to be very cautious about it. I've made sure all my managers understand that people need to think differently than they normally did and that we need to encourage people to take time off, take time during the day. It's particularly hard on our mothers uh, who are trying to be teachers at the same time and sometimes our fathers are doing that as well. Um, so you've got a job, you're, you're trying to be teachers and then you're also got a lot of times folks that have been unhealthy during, you know, family members that are sick. You know, I, I've got a family member um, that's going through COVID right now as well. And there's things that take great stress on you. And so I think you really need to be careful about it. But as always, as a leader, I think you got to live by example. And so, you know, since March 15th, I've walked 1,500 miles. I walk six miles a day, you know, to, just to make sure that people understand. And I take, I assign time during the middle of the day, what normally would be my lunch break. And, uh, and I, and I walk and I, I tell them on the phone all the time, that's what I'm doing. Not everyone is doing it, but a bunch are. And now there's a bit of a competition going on. Um, we actually, with our HSA, we gave them all Fitbits. And so if they walk, um, they earn money back, um, which is a really cool thing. And so they can put that in their flex spending accounts. And, um, and there are people that get as much as $1,000 a year um, in their flex spending account by just taking care of their their need to do steps during the day. And so, but it's really a culture that, that says that um, employees come first and that we care about them. And so their personal health is really important to us first. And, and that's, that's what we're preaching every day. And, um, you know, our success comes from them. If I lose one of them because of a health issue, we're gonna have to make up ground. And, um, and then that's not something a good leader would let happen in their organization. Shout out to Tom. Both of us have two replaced knees, so uh, keep walking, Tom. Andrea, uh, you want to share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I will. Um, you know, we do many of the same things that Tom talked about, but um, I, I'll say we're in a crisis situation around mental health and wellness. And for the last two years, even before COVID, the stress that people have been facing is something that we've seen in our 210,000 people workforce. And so We've rolled out a partnership with Ariana Huffington and Thrive. Um, we do lots of uh, wellness things. We've got meditation apps online. I'm doing a Thrive session next week on my micro steps. And a micro step is what is one little change that you're gonna make to reduce stress? Maybe it's not looking at your inbox on a Sunday. Everyone on this call in school might need to do that. But as workers, you know, try not to look at your inbox on a Sunday. Try not to do emails after six. Try to go on a walk every day. Do a meditation app. Take your vacation days to the point that, that Tom made in the COVID environment, it, people don't get to take a normal, what they would describe as a normal vacation. So instead they're not taking vacation. And so we're really encouraging people to take vacation. We're gonna roll over days that don't get taken, but that's not our intent. Our intent is that people take time off. They get a perspective, they, they refresh. and. Um, it's, it's, you know, we pay for physicals, we pay for flu shots. Uh, and the other thing we're really promoting right now is get your flu shot, just so that we're trying to help people's overall health. And um, it's something that, you know, we're sharing tips on every day. So um, we know it's a crisis and we're doing everything we can to make sure that we're taking care of our employees so they can take care of their families. I read an article today that, you know, we've got daylight savings time coming up. On, on Sunday and um, it is one of those times where people struggle with mental health quite a bit because of the change in amount of sunlight they have and, and so I'm doubling down on the same issue again with our organization is that I want them to be out, think about how they can be out in the daylight. Daylight's really important um, to your immune system but also to your mental health and, and so um, and we're trying to encourage that as well. And I know Bank America, and we have it as well. Uh, we often encourage people, we, they can go and get mental health um, help through our, med, our, our healthcare plan. And um, we talk about it all the time as no, it's not a, 
it is it is not something that people should be ashamed of. It's something that is um, responsible to make sure that they're managing their own mental health. And the problem is, it's kind of like a boiling frog, right? You don't, you know, first you put the frog in the water and it's nice and cool. He's swimming around. He doesn't know it's getting hotter, right? And that's the same thing with with stress. Is you don't know you're under stress. Mm -hmm. um, you, don't, you don't realize how much damage it's done doing to you physically and. You know, now at 61, I really get it. I mean, it could be life-threatening. And, yeah. um, and it's, it's, uh, it's something that everyone should take seriously, even young people. It's affecting young people in my organization as well. And so I, I, would, I would tell all the students to make sure that they've got something other than work in their life that helps them have balance. And someone they can talk to, I think. And this is another thing that we do courageous conversations around all the time. And I talk about it's okay not to be okay. Just let us know and we can help get the resources that you need. Cherie, you're, you're one of, you, you can relate most to our students because you were a student a couple of years ago. Do you have any tools or anything you do as a young person to kind of keep mentally uh, healthy? I'm big on naps. I'm a huge napper. So <laughs> whenever I feel myself, like I always kind of plan out 30 minutes anywhere in a day, just an extra 30 minutes to where like, if I feel like I'm getting overly stressed or like I'm dealing with something too much, I'll take a quick 30 minute nap. Cause when I wake up, I'm like, okay, I feel a little bit better. And I can, it's kind of like a recharge. Cause I mean, when you sleep anyway, that's your mind recharging. So I'm big on naps. And then also just like they said, recognizing that you are stressed because a lot of times you're going from school to going straight into work or just working all day. Like I find myself working, like I don't get, technically I don't get off work till seven. I get off at five, but I don't stop working till like seven, eight o'clock. And that's not healthy, you know? So being able to cut yourself off and know like, hey, I, I need to stop. I'm stressing myself out. I just need a little, little quick five, 10 minute cat nap. That's how I personally do it. But whether it be walking, whether it be singing in the shower, whether it be going outside, blowing bubbles for 10 minutes, whatever you got to do to just kind of like step away. Um, and I will also say this from like a, in like a, I don't want to say millennial standpoint, I guess, but social media, I think drives a lot of the stress as mm -hmm. well, because you see all these people, you know, doing great things and, all, you know, you're peers and stuff doing all these great things and it doesn't seem like they're stressed or it seems like you're the only one going through what you're going through I promise you you're not you know someone always told me Instagram is the highlight reel of your life so what you may see may not be what's really going on with someone so kind of disconnect for a little bit I know that's like oh my goodness why do I have to do that it's not stressing me out but you'll see if you stop going on Instagram for just a week you'll see how much your temperate level goes down the following week. So just some to, to try out. <laughs> That's great. great advice. Mm -hmm. I would recommend what you just said. Yeah. Get off the, don't watch the news and don't get on social media as often as you are. We got a great closing question, I feel. Uh, now, Sheree, I'm gonna start with you and you guys have, have had an opportunity, hopefully to think a little bit about these, you got these in advance. But if you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, what would it say? And why would it say that? Um, I have two. The first one would be one that says, please hire me. <laughs> that always have up just in case, you know, just in case. But uh, another one that I would have would probably be like, you're almost there. So no matter who sees it, whether I'm looking at it or someone's looking at it, they'll be like, even when it's almost close to giving up, you're almost there. So right before you quit, I promise you, you're, you're, you're going to be there. So between, between those two. <laughs> awesome. Where would you, do you have a place you'd have that, that billboard, Charisse? Right. It's right next to um, the Mercedes-Benz Aperture Stadium, right off Martin Luther King Drive and Lee Street. So if anybody is from Atlanta or knows what I'm talking about, right there. <laughs> what about you, Tom? I was uh, I was hoping this would be the question you didn't get around to asking me. But, uh, I guess I first of all, my organization is in charge of marketing the city for tourism, and so my billboard. Uh, we actually have lots of billboards, but my billboard would say, you know, come visit Charlotte because we really have an amazing city here, and um, 
what's happening in a large part from the leadership of, the, of people at Bank America, uh, our, our community is really coming into its own and it's on fire um, in a positive way. And, and it's just exciting to see the success that's happening and the millennial um, explosion in, in our city um, and the investment that people are making into our community, but also I think just a really good place to be. And so I, I would promote Charlotte um, because for me, this is my community now, and I believe that um, that's something that I should do. And I don't have another better answer for that, so. Always selling the city, that's awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, Andrea, you can close us out. We're about to the end of our time together. Um, I think my billboard would say get engaged and just get engaged. Figure out, find your voice, figure out what your passion is, put your voice at the table. We need everybody in this country to be engaged. Vote. I mean, we could take this so many different directions. We could talk about um, this is a movement, not a moment, but we're only going to make change if everybody gets engaged. I don't, you know, people sit around and talk about the change they want to drive or create, but then they don't do anything about it get engaged. Together we can drive the change that we need to do for our country, for our people, for everybody. Awesome. Well, guys, it's been amazing. We knew it would, uh, time would go by quickly. Uh, that's the cornerstone of a great panel, I think, is uh, leaving people wanting more. Uh, and so we understand our students have other commitments and, and other things they have to do tonight, but it's been amazing. We thank each of you uh, for uh, spending some time with us. We had about 300 uh, students on to, to tonight, so that's a good thing. Um, can people contact you, LinkedIn, or those types of uh, opportunities? Um, Absolutely, and I would say if anyone has a question specifically, just shoot me an email. I am happy to follow up, and uh, we can have a, a virtual coffee at this point. Awesome. <laughs> I, I, I welcome it. And since I'm the hospitality leader in the, in the city of Charlotte, it would be great if some of the hospitality students are interested in, in, in linking into me. I'm always surprised how few people do that after I teach classes, but <laughs> more opportunity for you. Listen, take it. He's saying it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Because that's the people that stand out. So yeah. <laughs> and send, send, send you some sales leads, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, make your career decision in Charlotte. We'd appreciate it. Um, we know how good USC students are. So, yes, we do. And I would say banking is not boring. So, you know, <laughs> we, we, we have a lot of different opportunities here. Uh, <laughs> all right, guys. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks again. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks, Sporty, for inviting us.